Welcome to today's lecture by Gretchen Morganson, Absence of Accountability for the 2008 Financial Crisis. My name is David Bob. I serve as director of the Alan P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship of Hillsdale College. Today's lecture, made possible by a generous gift from Hillsdale College alumni Sarah and Chris Chicola, is part of a monthly lecture series that addresses significant and timely political, historical, and economic topics from a constitutional perspective. The Kirby Center marks an extension of Hillsdale College's commitment to teaching the Constitution. Through teaching the enduring principles of the Declaration and the Constitution, the Kirby Center seeks to inspire citizens, that is, students, teachers, policymakers, and elected officials to return those principles to their central place in American public life. You may find out more about our programs online at thekirbycenter.org and also via Facebook and Twitter. If you are viewing this lecture online at the Kirby Center webcast or via C-SPAN's live stream, you may submit a question for today's speaker by emailing us at kirbylecture at hillsdale.edu. I will now ask Hillsdale College senior Bailey Jones to introduce our speaker. An English and political economy double major at Hillsdale College, Bailey is completing an internship with the Kirby Center here this summer as part of the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program, which for 40 years has sent our undergraduate students to Washington for what we like to joke is a study abroad program. <laughs> Bailey. Gretchen Morganson is the Assistant Business and Financial Editor at the New York Times. In 2002, she received the Pulitzer Prize for her coverage of Wall Street. Prior to joining the Times in 1998, she worked as the Assistant Managing Editor at Forbes Magazine and as the Executive Editor of Worth Magazine. She has also authored or co-authored several books, including Forbes' Great Minds of Business and Reckless Endangerment. She received her BA in English from St. Olive College. Today, Ms. Morganson will be speaking on the topic, The Absence of Accountability for the 2008 Financial Crisis. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Gretchen Morganson. Thank you so much, Bailey and David. It's really a joy for me to be here at the Kirby Center today and to learn more about the remarkable Hillsdale College, which I don't know enough about. I have a junior uh, in high school who's shopping for colleges, so I'm going to do a little due diligence on Hillsdale for him. I appreciate the invitation to come to speak today about this issue of accountability for the financial crisis of 2008 that we're still really trying to dig our way out of. It's something that I think few people would have predicted that four to five years after the events of 2007 and 2008 that we're still really trying to understand um, what happened uh, who did it, why, and how. Just going back in time a little bit, um, as Bailey mentioned, I was at Forbes magazine for many years before I joined the New York Times, and one of the joys of my job there was that I could write about companies doing the right thing as well as companies doing the wrong thing. Well, since I joined the Times in uh, May of 98, it really has felt to me like it's been all scandal all the time. First, we had the long-term capital management hedge fund debacle. We've had the internet bubble. We've had accounting scandals, Enron, WorldCom, et cetera, booms and busts, currency crises, bank failures. It's really just been an amazing 14 years, and I've had a ringside seat for all of it. Nevertheless, um, I did feel that the material that was thrown at me and other financial journalists in the years leading up to the crisis and the aftermath made all the previous crises seem like child's play. So now I feel like I'm almost an archaeologist at a historic site, still digging, uncovering, shocking, and really overwhelming evidence of deeply unethical activities that flourished during the mortgage mania. Simply put, the amount of lying and cheating that went on during the years leading up to the crisis is almost unimaginable, and I'm not sure that we even know all of it yet. 
First, of course, we had lenders who made loans to borrowers that could not repay them. The loans carried enormous fees and profits for the lenders, who then sold them to Wall Street. Then the executives at these firms did their parts by putting toxic loans into mortgage securities that were sold to unsuspecting investors. Those who bought the securities were told that the loans were high quality and met certain standards. This was not true. When these loans failed, the only recourse that these investors had was to sue the firms that sold the securities. Then, of course, there were the ratings agencies, who, according to some who dealt directly with them, knew that the loans were questionable, but assigned high grades to the securities that held them anyway. The money generated by rating these complex securities was just too compelling. Of course, borrowers played their part. Desperate to get in on the rising real estate market, they were only too happy to fib about their income or their financial positions. Their lies also contributed to the mess. While these scandalous activities were going on, financial regulators, the very people charged with identifying and eliminating problematic practices, were cheering on the miscreants. Even after danger signs relating to the credit mania had become obvious, officials at most regulatory agencies seemed bent on protecting the very, quote, financial innovation that had fueled the crisis. They recoiled at blocking complex and exotic mortgage products on the grounds that they could increase the benefits of home ownership, a goal that was claimed to be a win-win for everyone. And they rhapsodized about the marvels of derivatives and how they spread risk rather than concentrated it. So looking back, that was a whole lot of bad stuff going on. But those were just the practices during the boom years. Since then, during the bust, we've had a raft of bad behavior, dubious practices surrounding the foreclosure crisis, for example. Representatives of banks, in their haste to drum troubled borrowers out of their homes, forged legal documents, filed phony papers with the courts, and flouted hundreds of years of property law. Taken together during the boom and the bust, I would argue that this is a breathtaking series of ethical breakdowns and compliance failures. And it led to one of the most shattering financial crises in our history. But importantly, it has also generated deep questions about whether our country and those in its upper echelons of both business and government have lost their moral compass. Populist capitalism, like our system, is hugely beneficial to the vast majority of people. But an ethical tradition is needed for it to work. When you have senior executives walking away with hundreds of millions of dollars, leaving shareholders and innocent taxpayers holding the bag, it becomes extremely dangerous. And as more and more jobs disappear across the country, the outsized pay amassed by corporate executives and Wall Street traders becomes even more polarizing. This is especially so when taxpayers are asked to bail out reckless companies. Now the question that remains to be answered and that will have to be tackled by ethicists far better qualified than I is why did greed and unethical behavior go so viral during this recent period? I think one bit of an explanation lies in a rejection by some business leaders of a very powerful social compact that many of their predecessors had it once embraced. That is a duty to others rather than simply to self. According to this compact in its ideal, 
people in positions of power recognized that they had immense sway over investors, workers, and customers, and they agreed to hold themselves to a higher standard of care as a result. It was an unwritten rule, perhaps, but now it seems to have been supplanted by the notion that personal profits are supreme and that making it to the top and gaining respect from society means having the largest bank account. We also, I think importantly, seem entrenched in a system where amoral behavior is condoned because it is not per se illegal. Instead of asking if a deal is appropriate for everyone involved and doing the age-old gut check of wondering whether you'd cringe if the deal's details were laid out on the front page of the New York Times, executives and their advisors today seem to view their actions much more narrowly. If you can muster an argument that what you're doing is highly profitable and not outright illegal, then go for it. Who cares if it's immoral or wrong or hurts people? I have on my desk at work an old New Yorker cartoon that sums this up. In it are a group of executives seated in a boardroom. The man at the head of the table is saying, quote, remember, it's not a lie if it makes us money. Lies that made some people a lot of money were a crucial element of the credit crisis. Mortgage brokers selling loans to customers who didn't understand them. Wall Street firms peddling securities to clients who were not told of their faulty structures. Ratings agencies slapping high grades on securities they didn't understand or hadn't scrutinized. And very few of these participants have been held accountable for their deceptions. Indeed, these players continue to argue to anyone who will listen that their customers come first and that their due diligence is strong. These arguments are stunningly disconnected from reality. Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stieglitz summed things up pretty well when he said, America's financial players created risk, misallocated capital, and encouraged excessive indebtedness, all while imposing high transaction costs. And they brought our entire economy to the brink. But to this day, we hear regulators and, of course, those in the industry extolling the praises of financial innovation. And yet many of the innovations that were roundly praised in the years leading up to the crisis did contribute mightily to its depth and damage. Credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations are two perfect examples. These products amplified, expanded the mortgage meltdown and its losses. This is not what financial innovation should create. True financial innovation should help society, not hurt it. Rather than raising investors and borrowers' risks through obscure and hard to fathom investments and instruments, financial innovation should have helped these people mitigate the risks of home ownership. But instead, they helped a small band of industry participants profit at the expense of the rest of us. In spite of this, we continue to hear from bankers that tighter regulation of the financial sector will cripple their innovative tendencies. Indeed, these institutions, their executives, and lobbyists continue to resist significant regulation designed to prevent taxpayers from having to bail out any of their companies in the future. Now, this failure to admit culpability is bad enough. But it has also been worsened, exacerbated, by an even more disturbing failure by the government to assign responsibility for this mess. Holding people who were central to the crisis accountable for their roles in it has seemed just too difficult 
for our government regulators and prosecutors to do. Let's consider the case of Angelo Mozillo, the former chief executive of Countrywide Financial, once one of the nation's largest subprime lenders. He was sued by the SEC in 2009 for insider trading because the regulators alleged he had publicly pronounced his company healthy while privately derided the quality of the mortgages Countrywide was writing, using words like toxic and poison in internal emails, Mr. Mozillo seemed to understand well the risks that his company was taking in the subprime mortgage boom. But publicly, meanwhile, he maintained that his company was first class and financially sound. All the while, he was selling shares that he had received as compensation while running countrywide. In fact, he sold $500 million worth of stock over several years' time as the subprime crisis was approaching. The SEC said that he sold these shares improperly because he knew the dangers that were facing his company. And yet, a year later, in 2010, the SEC struck a settlement deal with Mozilla requiring him to pay just $22.5 million to end the case. That's $22.5 million against $500 million in stock sales. That's a pretty good trade. I think most of us would take that. Meanwhile, the rest of the fines that were levied by the SEC, $45.5 million, were paid by Bank of America or its insurers. So what's the lesson that we can all take away from this example? Get while the getting is good, and if you get nabbed, well, you'll probably be able to get off for pennies on the dollar. During the financial crisis, in fact, it seems that we've been all too happy to lower the bar for what constitutes bad behavior. Instead, one of the, indeed, one of the arguments for why there have not been more criminal prosecutions following the debacle is that the actions taken by people in positions of power were not technically illegal. <coughs> it certainly wasn't right or proper for the head of a large financial institution not to understand the risks that his underlings were taking to make their sumptuous bonuses. But was it illegal? Perhaps not. And that's why some people say we have seen no prosecutions of those who marched Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Countrywide, and Merrill Lynch off the cliff. Neither was it correct or proper to sell a mortgage security to customers that had been designed to fail. But was it illegal? The investment banks who sold such things have argued that they disclosed all the necessary details in the boilerplate of the prospectuses. So, they maintain, they did not run afoul of securities laws. Not long ago, Eric Holder, the head of the Justice Department, made such a distinction in a speech at Columbia University Law School. He said there, quote, much of the conduct that led to the financial crisis was unethical and irresponsible. But we also have discovered that some of the behavior while morally reprehensible, may not necessarily have been criminal." End quote. There he is explaining what everyone wants to know, why there have not been more criminal prosecutions. It's hard, I think, for many people to accept this argument. It's just too hard to believe that a financial debacle so large and so destructive as this one did not involve any criminal activity. I certainly am the first to say that I am not a prosecutor, but that I do understand well how difficult it is to mount a criminal case. But because so many people have been hurt by the destructive activities and their outcomes, it's incredibly disturbing for many to see leaders of American corporations amid this mess walk away from the wreckage 
pretty much unscathed. <clears throat> yes, they've suffered losses in their stock holdings, and many are facing private litigation, but the damage that they and others like them have done to innocent taxpayers, borrowers, and shareholders is nothing short of titanic. These wrecking crews appear to have paid little for their transgressions. The trouble is, if prosecutors don't pursue a wide array of illegal activities, then you wind up encouraging more of the very destructive behavior. By not punishing these practices quickly, firmly, and forcefully, you incentivize the miscreants to push the envelope even further the next time. If there's no penalty for illegality, then there certainly is none for amorality. Of course, again, it's hard to mount criminal cases. But at last count, only one relatively high-level mortgage banking official had been sentenced to jail time in a case arising out of the meltdown. His name was Lee Farkas, and he led a $3 billion fraud running a lender called Taylor, Bean, and Whitaker. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. All well and good, but Taylor, Bean, and Lee Farkas were certainly not at the center of the financial crisis. It is possible, of course, that additional indictments and prison sentences will be forthcoming. But the fact that so few people have been held accountable for this particular mess by the spring of 2012 makes some people wonder if there's something more pernicious at work, perhaps a concerted effort to protect some of the primary participants from prosecution. This is not an idle question. Given that so many high-powered players were involved in the questionable practices that led to the crisis, many hailing from Wall Street and Washington, digging too deeply into the mess could touch some mighty participants. One might well ask whether the government really wants to identify who did what to whom during this episode. With regulators at the Federal Reserve, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the Comptroller of the Currency, and the SEC so involved in allowing the bad practices leading up to the crisis to go on, you would wonder whether a hard-nosed government investigator might not wind up probing himself or his colleagues. It's my belief that many people in Washington know that if they launched a full-blown investigation of the meltdown, the spotlight might soon come to their door. I think it's really important to point out that our current situation with zero prosecutions stands in stark contrast to what went on during the SNL crisis of the late 80s and early 90s. That was a period when hundreds of banks failed. But in the wake of that mess, special government task forces referred 1,100 cases to prosecutors resulting in more than 800 bank officials going to jail. Many of these people were chief executives, not lower level flunkies. Among the best known, Charles Keating, CEO of Lincoln Savings and Loan in Arizona, and David Paul, head of Centrust Bank in Florida. Here's another data point that I find interesting because of its contrast to today. In the early 1990s, President Bush made it clear that ferreting out fraud at the SNLs was a top priority of his administration. He directed the Justice Department to make these cases with vigor. If we fast forward to the current crisis, we find the opposite approach. In the spring of 2008, just as the storm was gathering, the FBI scaled back plans to assign more field agents to investigate mortgage fraud. That summer, just weeks before the collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Lehman and AIG, the Department of Justice also rejected calls to create a task force devoted to mortgage-related investigations, leaving these complex cases 
understaffed, and poorly funded. Only much later did the Justice Department establish a more general financial crimes task force. Why have there been so few prosecutions that succeeded out of this mess? Some of the prosecutors that I've spoken to in my reporting argue that the types of fraud perpetrated during the SNL crisis were easier to litigate. Those cases were characterized by embezzlement, self-dealing, and other bad behavior that was more easily identified and exposed. While we do know that Wall Street likes to create complexity, and there's no doubt that the securities involved in this debacle were far more convoluted and impenetrable for investigators to plumb. But I think a more interesting reason for the failure to prosecute lies, with <clears throat> lies in an answer I've been given by some prosecutors. It brings us right back to the colossal regulatory failure that fueled the crisis. We all know regulators declined to rein in dubious practices in the boom years, but the failure had dire consequences in addition to the millions of borrowers who were hurt and investors and taxpayers. This regulatory incompetence, prosecutors argue to me, led to a lack of prosecutions in the aftermath of the bubble. That's because so many of the overseers failed in their duties to compile the kinds of information that traditionally is used to build successful criminal cases. So in effect, the same dynamic that helped enable the crisis, weak regulation, asleep at the switch regulators, also made it harder to pursue fraud in its aftermath. Let's go back to the SNL crisis to talk about how important regulatory referrals are to successful prosecutions. In that period, the FBI opened 5,500 criminal investigations using regulatory referrals. And again, as I mentioned a moment ago, by 1992, there had been 1,100 criminal prosecutions of major bank fraud resulting in 839 convictions. A more aggressive mindset among regulators could certainly have spurred more prosecutions this time around, according to officials who were involved in the SNL cleanup. One of them is William Black, a professor of law at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. He was the federal government's director of litigation during the SNL crisis, and he told me that the relaxed regulatory approach in the current episode, quote, created an exceptional criminogenic environment. There were no criminal referrals from regulators, no fraud working groups, no national task force, no effective punishment, he said. Instead, we've had pretty much silence from the highest levels of government. Michael Mukasey, a former federal judge in New York who had been head of the Justice Department less than a year when Bear Stearns failed, discussed at that time setting up a task force with deputies, but decided against it, announcing the decision in June of 2008. Now, there have been some attempts to put money into investigations. For example, two years into the crisis, Congress passed the Fraud Enforcement and Recovery Act allocating $165 million to the Justice Department and FBI for new financial crisis cases. But Congress quietly took away all but $30 million of that allocation later. So put all of these actions or inactions together, and I think you can see how this has contributed to our current and frustrating situation where participants in one of the biggest economic disasters in history seem to have skated away from the scene untouched. Equally disturbing, the failure to put resources into law enforcement on these cases confirms a dangerous suspicion that many Americans hold. That is, that there are two sets of rules in our nation. 
one for Washington and the powerful companies that contribute to their reelection campaigns, and one for the rest of us. Even when the securities, the top securities cops at the SEC have a clear standard to pursue executives under Sarbanes-Oxley, they come up decidedly short. After the grand frauds at Enron, WorldCom, and Adelphia, Congress set out to hold executives accountable if their companies cooked the books. Under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, the SEC was encouraged to hit executives where it hurts, in the wallet, if they certified financial results that turned out to be bogus. Sarbox was supposed to keep managers honest. They would have to hand back incentive pay, like bonuses, even if they themselves did not fudge the accounts. That was the idea, anyway, but the record suggests a bark decidedly worse than bite. The SEC brought its first case under Section 304 of Sarbox in 2007. By late 2011, it had filed cases demanding that only 31 executives at 20 companies return some pay. In 2007 and 8, most of the cases involved shenanigans relating to stock options and produced some big recoveries for the SEC. But in the wake of the financial crisis, the dollars recouped have amounted to an asterisk. From the beginning of 2009 through 2011, the SEC pursued 18 executives at 10 companies. It has re recovered a total of $12.2 million from nine former executives. Other cases are pending. Half of the companies pursued by the SEC during the past three years have been small and relatively obscure. For those interested in accountability in the mortgage crisis, the clawback case brought by the SEC against New Century Financial, now defunct, but one of the most aggressive mortgage lenders out there, is a severe disappointment. Michael Missel, a partner at the law firm of K&L Gates, and the bankruptcy examiner hired to investigate New Century, uncovered seven different types of accounting fraud, he said, that fattened the pay of the company's top executives in 2005 and 6. During those years, he found Brad Morris, the company's chief executive, collected $2.9 million in incentive pay. But when the SEC brought its clawback case, it considered a much narrower series of accounting irregularities and recovered only $542,000 from Mr. Morris. Never mind that as Mr. Missel, the examiner, told me, quote, I found many serious violations in the investigation and laid them out as clearly as possible with all the supporting information. How assiduously the SEC brings these cases could not be more important. That's because only the SEC can bring cases under Section 304. Companies can't, and neither can shareholders. But even when it does crack down on wrongdoers, the SEC does little to discourage them from becoming recidivists. According to a New York Times analysis by my colleague Ed Wyatt, nearly all of the biggest financial companies in the nation, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Bank of America among them, have settled fraud cases by promising that they would never again violate an anti-fraud law. And yet all of these companies were found by the SEC to have done just that a few years after they made their promises. The Times analysis of enforcement actions during the past 15 years found at least 51 cases in which the SEC concluded that Wall Street firms had broken anti-fraud laws that they had agreed never to breach. The 51 cases spanned 19 different companies. And yet, in the face of this recidivism, the Commission has not brought any contempt charges against large financial firms in the last 10 years. I think when we consider these facts, 
it shouldn't come as a surprise that trust in our nation's institutions, both public and private, have been decimated as a result of the crisis and its aftermath. The credit crisis was a two-pronged failure, after all. First, the failure by the private sector to rein itself in or to limit itself to appropriate business practices in some cases. But second was the abysmal regulatory performance. The failure by people at the highest levels of our financial system to understand the risky practices being pursued by some of the nation's largest banks was nothing short of breathtaking. This inability or refusal to recognize peril when it was staring them in the face meant that Ben Bernanke and his regulatory colleagues were far behind when the subprime crisis began to metastasize. It seems pretty clear to me and to a lot of the readers that I hear from that many people in positions of power seem to have lost their sense of duty and obligation to others. There is a decidedly me-first approach that dominates today. I don't know how to force people in high places to forego profits for propriety. I do know that those of us in the media can help by shining light on the dark corners where such practices often flourish. Still, to regain confidence after enduring this mess, I believe that at least some of the people who blew up these institutions must be held accountable for their actions. Investors, pensioners, employees, and taxpayers all have been hurt by reckless risk-taking at the highest level of some of these companies. It will be beyond exasperating if the people who created this disaster and profited mightily from it are allowed to slink off into the night. I'd like to close with a quote from Frederick Bastiat, a 19th century economist and writer that seems especially on point. He said the following, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it, and a moral code that glorifies it. That's what we are all up against, and we must not allow it to prevail. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to take questions from the audience. This person's hand shot right up. My name, is, my name is Bruce Bennett. Uh, I'm locally here in Vienna, Virginia. But one question I have is, have, have we let the banks fail and not, not uh, bail them out? Would the country have crashed as, a, as the people said it would, or would we have had a better, stronger financial system with those people out? Uh, if the banks had been allowed to fail, would we be in a better position now because, uh, or would we have fallen off the cliff in the financial system? Um, you know, very difficult question to answer. Uh, I'll answer in two parts. One is that the way that I would have liked to have seen this crisis played out, if I could go and restart the movie and start the reel running again, would be for the government to allow Bear Stearns to fail in March of 2008 because Bear Stearns was a smallish firm. It was extremely heavily into mortgages, so sort of had made its bed, um, taken great risks, taken immense profits in this area. Uh, you know, I think that the fact that the Federal Reserve pushed J.P. Morgan Chase into the shotgun wedding with Bear Stearns sent a very pernicious message to the markets, to the financial firms, which was that you'll get help, you'll get salvaged, you'll get bailed out, you'll, you don't have to pay the price of failure. Um, I think Bear Stearns would have been a, a less damaging failure if it had been allowed than Lehman was, which was a larger firm with more interconnections, I think. So if I were to, you know, want to go back in time and change how things were done, I would like to see what happened if Bear Stearns were allowed to fail. I think if it were allowed to fail, people would have gotten the message pretty quick that you better get your house in order. And remember, there was a six-month period after Bear Stearns failed in which really 
very little happened. It was a calm before the storm of September 2008 when we had this nonstop failures, Fannie, Freddie, uh, Lehman, AIG. So there was a six-month window of opportunity there that I think could have been used to be much more aggressive about getting down assets on balance sheets, taking leverage down if possible. So that's one answer to your question. And the other answer that I would say is <clears throat> we just have to get to a position where these large firms are not so uh, interconnected that they can actually make the argument that if they fail, they could bring down the financial system. It is clear to me that everybody who was running the country then believed that if they were allowed to fail, that they would bring down the financial system. And <clears throat> when you talk to people about Lehman Brothers, they felt that that was the lesson from Lehman, the failure of the money market funds, et cetera, that that was clear, you can't let these things fail. So the reaction to me should be, how can we get these banks, institutions, brokerage firms, whatever, down to a size that's manageable and that won't imperil the entire financial system? if they take too many risks. We have gotten nowhere with that kind of an approach, and that's unfortunate. Yes. Um, Roman Bueller with the Madison Coalition. I noticed that there were two groups that you did not explicitly discuss in your um, analysis. One are the elected politicians who uh, empowered uh, Fannie and Freddie to borrow all these that's and... A, that's a week-long discussion, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and who, of course, then um, spent taxpayer money to bail all these folks out, uh, and who then, if you look at uh, uh, Barney Frank and Chris Dodd, who were both deeply involved in the process, authored a, a bill uh, allegedly to solve the problem. And the other group was you didn't mention the, uh, the business media. And one of the things we count on is when politicians misbehave as they generically do, and when the private sector uh, prioritizes profit and bends the rules, as sometimes happens, shouldn't we actually blame the business media for not blowing the whistle uh, on some of these activities uh, way before they did? Um, certainly agree with both of your um, themes. Um, the uh, role of uh, legislators uh, cannot be minimized, but again, it is a, an enormously long conversation. Um, I did tackle it in my book, Reckless Endangerment, with my co-author, Josh Rosner, and um, you know, we were quite, um, I think, unsparing with the details on just how, how Fannie Mae really was the kind of leader in teaching companies how to co-opt Congress, how to neutralize their regulator, and how to make sure that they were able to make all the decisions about things like regulatory capital and, um, you know, uh, their business model, and meanwhile get rich while they're doing it. So, yes, that's a huge topic, and one that has also not been addressed in any meaningful way after the crisis. Um, as far as the business media, I certainly would agree that they did not do, we did not do as good a job as we should have in the years leading up to the crisis. I think there may be a couple of reasons for that. Um, first is a kind of mindset that you have to have. I'm a tough reporter and I like being a tough reporter, but it's hard. You have to have a backbone. You have to have an editor who is willing to stand up against the pressures, which are immense. Um, and you have to have a different mindset. You don't want to be a part of the party. You don't want to be invited to the people's houses who you cover. You don't want to be feeling like you're part of that scene. And there are a lot of journalists who unfortunately get sucked into the idea that they can be friends with the people that they're covering. I don't do that kind of journalism, but I think that it's unfortunate that there are quite a few who do. Now, I will also say, though, that uh, newsrooms have been devastated by the internet and the creative destruction that the internet has brought to the newspaper business. And so you will have far fewer newsrooms who have local reporters covering local, you know, scandals 
far fewer reporters covering business, far fewer reporters covering everything because the numbers just don't work anymore. The, the revenues are just not there, and so you have to lay people off. So I think that's an element that has to be um, recognized also. I did uh, raise red flags very early on, in 2000, as early as 2005, when Fannie Mae had their accounting scandal, talked about mortgage crises, talked about credit default swaps very early on. So I know what you have to take from people when you take these large institutions on, and it's not fun. But if you want to try to educate, expose the truth, that's what journalists are uh, supposed to do. I am a firm believer that that's, you know, the, the standard that we should hold ourselves to. I just wish there were more people that I could consider in the same bailiwick. But there are new kids coming up all the time, and I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe we can change that dynamic. We actually have a question from an online viewer, Anna, from Houston, Texas, and she asks, you have called for greater criminal prosecution against the perpetrators of the financial crisis. Yet you have also noted that their actions were immoral rather than illegal. If this is so, how would criminal charges be just, considering they broke no laws? Well, again, this is the question of did they break no laws? And, you know, not being a prosecutor and not knowing, not having all the facts at my disposal, I'm just unaware. I, I can't make the conclusion that there was broad uh, swaths of illegality here. However, I do think it's hard to imagine that you can't bring some cases, even for regulators to bring cases under Sarbanes-Oxley. So I think the degree to which there has been so little um, uh, regulatory or criminal prosecutions just sends a, a bad signal. Um, you know, the case I mentioned with Angela Mozillo seems to be a prime example. <coughs> of sort of walking away from what looked like, you know, a pretty um, fact-oriented, fact-based case. Uh, again, perhaps Eric Holder is right. Perhaps there was no illegal activity. But I don't think, I, I think that that's a um, perception that people don't support because I think early on, my reporting and my colleagues' reporting shows that early on there was a sense at the highest levels in Washington that we shouldn't pursue these institutions until we got on a firmer financial footing. There was a sense that we didn't want to um, aggressively pursue prosecutions while we were still trying to find our way in the dire months of 2008, 2009. And I think that led to a, a, a sort of a, a, a lax approach to the idea of prosecuting some of these cases. And of course, we have time limits, and we have all kinds of statutes of limitation that are running on these cases, whether we're talking civil or criminal. So there's a real danger, I think, in saying, let's not do anything right now until things settle down and get more calm. The danger is that you let precious uh, hours go by, weeks, months, and precious data and information that you need to have to make a case go by. But I think that what Professor Black has told me and other prosecutors is that there certainly were civil cases that were not made. There certainly were regulatory cases that were not made strongly enough. And even if those had been made, I think you'd have a different perception out there about accountability than we have today. Yes. Wait, wait for your microphone. Uh, we're talking about the, pri the corporation, and I've, I've, uh, I'd like your thoughts on this. Uh, corporations, uh, executives, are supposed to be responsible for the, to the directors, who in turn are responsible to the stockholders. The truth is, the directors are often picked by the chairman. They socialize. The night before the meeting, they and their spouses have dinner, and the next day, the director is expected to look them in the eye and say, Bill, you're overpaid, which is very hard to do. Right. Behind that is the stockholder, who's supposed to be able to vote the rascals out. The truth is, I can buy a stock on the phone right now and sell it in 10 minutes, so I have no incentive to stand and fight. Has anyone 
thought about some way to uh, inject the uh, true scrutiny in the corporate process that just isn't there right now? Is it, have you ever heard it brought up or discussed by anybody? I've certainly heard the question brought up, which is why don't we have more um, aggressive uh, shareholder activism or even just policing, shareholder policing of boards, because there is this sense, and I think it's absolutely accurate, that boards are cronies of the uh, management and that they're yes men and women and that, um, you know, maybe they are there to justify what their decisions are, but in any case, CEO pay keeps ratcheting up. Uh, very few people held accountable when there are disasters, um, you know, that are, that are uncovered. So, uh, you know, one of my biggest, um, uh, one of the things I think is the biggest dysfunction in the system right now is something you're alluding to, which is um, the failure of large institutions that run your money, my money, to hold these people accountable and hold their feet to the fire. I mean, if I own 100 shares of Exxon and I vote against the pay package, that's not going to have any impact whatsoever. If I'm Fidelity and I'm you know, voting shares that are held uh, on behalf of thousands, millions of people across the country, you're going to have a lot more clout. But these companies do not really take this on as a goal or as a, a purpose. And I find that to be very disturbing. They're running other people's money, and yet they're not acting responsibly in holding boards accountable. And holding boards accountable is really the only way that you can start to get to the point where you can hold the executives accountable. Now, we have seen this year a little bit more um, action on pay practices. We've seen some pay um, compensation deals that were rejected by a majority of the shareholders. That's very unusual. That seems like it's a start in an idea of being, you know, shareholders expressing their views. But it is a slow, slow process. And if we don't have the help of the people who are managing our money for us, if Fidelity or Vanguard or name your fund company doesn't want to rock the boat, perhaps because they have other dealings with the companies whose shares they own, then that's a problem. And that contributes to the um, sort of uh, laissez-faire board uh, approach that I think is common at so many companies. So, uh, you know, one person said to me they thought that maybe social media could be a way to get shareholders together to act as a group. That would be great. That would be a great outcome of of social media, but I haven't seen it yet. And again, this is a, a glacial process to even get shareholders to vote against um, munificent pay packages. So I'm as frustrated as you are. Washington's response to the financial de debacle was an enactment of the Dodd-Frank uh, legislation, now the Dodd-Frank law. What is your assessment of that statute's uh, potential to keep such debacles from happening in the future? I guess another way of putting that is, did Congress know what it was doing when it was passing that, and did Obama know what he was doing when he, when he signed it? Thank you. I think the Dodd-Frank law was a... Um it, it's 2,000 pages of, you know, impenetrable, um, complex details that really end up not protecting us anywhere, you know, it may be even not protecting us a bit more than we were leading up to the crisis. Um, I, it, I like to compare it to Glass-Steagall. Uh, Glass-Steagall was 34 pages long. Uh, Dodd-Frank is 2,000 pages long. Glass-Steagall protected us for about 70 years. <laughs> I don't think Dodd-Frank's going to protect us for even 10. I think that the key, their key failures in Dodd-Frank, first of all, they did nothing. They were silent on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Didn't have the, you know, the, the spine to go after that. Uh, second of all, they did nothing about too big to fail. Now, you know, um, Dodd and Frank will say, oh, yes, we did. We've put together these, um, what do they call, resolution authority. There's the resolution authority that's going to allow a, a, an unwind of a threatening institution if it's too big and too large and, and too politically 
are interconnected or if it's on the precipice, we will unwind this through the resolution uh, authority. But the problem with the resolution authority is that it requires the uh, committee, the FSOC it's called, to vote to in fact resolve and unwind the institution. And I think that that is a step that many, many people would not choose to take. It would again be a, a moment just as the moments that faced uh, Geithner and Paulson in 2008, which was, it's easier just to bail it out. It's easier just to p make the taxpayers pay and then deal with it later than it is to make the hard decisions to let a firm get unwound. And these are very large and powerful firms that have a lot of friends in Washington. So I, I am just very dubious that the Resolution Authority is going to work as well as Dodd and Frank seem to think that it will in resolving large interconnected uh, institutions. So I think there were a lot of failures. There were some good things about Dodd-Frank, but for the 2,000 pages of whatever, you know, I just don't think it's put us that much closer to a period where the taxpayers can sleep at night without worrying about having to bail out companies in the future. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Tyler O'Neill, a uh, recent Hillsdale graduate and aspiring journalist. Oh, so really? Good for you. You'll I be a tough one, right? <laughs> That's the idea. Okay. Uh, my Good. question is regarding the idea of regulations and holding these businesses accountable. Uh, President Wilson famously argued that the economy had become so complicated that we needed a bigger government to rein in excesses. And yet we see a movement like the Tea Party that wants smaller government, smaller regulations. And it seems that you're talking almost both sides of the spectrum, that it would have been better if we could, hadn't bailed out these businesses and just let them fall apart from their own bad practices. But at the same time, you want to hold people accountable, responsible, and we need more administration to do that. So well, I, think, I think letting them fail would hold them accountable, right? I mean, to some degree, right? If they failed, then that would be the first step to accountability. But no, you're right. You know, it's, it's a fine line, I think, to walk. You can't, you, uh, you can't have zero regulation. You can't have too much regulation. So how, where is the happy medium? Now, I have never made the argument that there was not enough regulation on the mortgage industry or financial services industry going in the years leading up to the crisis. There were plenty of rules on the books that the regulators just did not pursue. And so what I would say the answer is, is to have people in these jobs that have an appetite to regulate and have an appetite to really go after the problems that they see. But there becomes this mindset in the regulatory community where you're kind of a partner with the entity that you're overseeing. You're, you've got the same, you know, kind of uh, brain meld, as it were, almost with the bankers that you're dealing with. In fact, many of the um, regulators in the years leading up to the crisis were believing that the banks had the answer on their risk assessments and were, could be allowed to present regulators with their own assessments of risks on their books and let regulators sort of work with that instead of the regulator being the person who's sort of the watchdog or policeman. So I think that there were rules that were completely ignored uh, by regulators in the years leading up to the crisis, so I don't feel that we needed way more regulation at all. We just needed people with an appetite to regulate, uh, which we did, not, we did not have. In fact, they were, in many cases, <clears throat> you know, uh, partnering with institutions, the idea of reducing capital requirements and reducing those kinds of standards. So, that was, I think, a disappointing element at work. So it's not, more regulation is not the answer because you have to have people who are willing to actually regulate. Um, one of the, in my, uh, in the book that Josh and I wrote, Reckless Endangerment, we had a conversation with Barney Frank when we were asking him about his undying support for Fannie Mae. And he had been particularly difficult um, and particularly obstreperous with the regulator that was um, put in place in the mid-90s to try to beef up regulation on Fannie. And he would, you know, he was tough, 
in congressional hearings, he would, you know, rail, um, really made it, made life difficult for this regulator. And so we asked him, what was the idea of being so hard on this guy? He's just trying to do his job. And he said, I felt that they were trying to be too adversarial. And I said, well, hmm, adversarial. Adversarial kind of sounds like a good thing for a regular to, regulator to be. No, 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 they were too adversarial. That's not the right ideal for a regulator. So, you know, it's almost like a journalist. I mean, people who I write about who don't like what I write call me adversarial, but, you know, I am not a part of their corporate spin. Well, a regulator should not be a part of the spin of the institution they're regulating. So I thought that was a very interesting comment that he made, which revealed a lot about the regulatory community and, and, and how it is you know, viewed and seen by members of Congress who oversee these people. So that was kind of an eye-opener for me. You know, but I would argue for a more adversarial relationship than less. We have time for one more question. This person's been very, very patient here. Here you go. So I don't see any hope for oh, don't say that. actual <laughs> things happening, regulators, everyone. What do you think is the ultimate answer? Uh, the ultimate answer to getting us out of this boom-bust bailout cycle? And for any, and for any um, illegal or immoral actions on the part of government and businesses. I think, again, I think we just have to see a few cases. It wouldn't take a lot of cases. It wouldn't take hundreds of cases. It would take maybe one prosecutor who's trying to make his or her spurs to, you know, make people sit up and take notice. But again, I think it's a multifaceted um, question. It goes to the question about boards, and it goes to the question of investors. And so, you know, it's, it's massive, and so there are a lot of failings at every step of the way. So what can we do as individuals to try to change this dynamic? Um, this is the toughest question I get, and I'm very disappointed to say that I don't have a ready answer, because it does feel like individuals are powerless. It does feel like individuals have no voice and are particularly up against, you know, ever increasing power. Um, on the other side of some of these very important issues. So I'm not without hope, but I think that the idea is that people have to take some of this on themselves, and whether it's um, you know, complaining to uh, your fund company if you don't like the way they vote your shares, uh, voting no against excessive pay at companies even if you only have 10 shares. I mean, it's a message that you can send, but it really is, uh, I agree with you, a, a, there is a sense that it's not going to get a lot of traction. Um, and that's unfortunate because we're ultimately the people who are paying the price. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. I will close with one announcement that uh, later this week, you all are welcome to join us for uh, Friday evening reception and talk. Uh, professor Stephen Smith, uh, uh, Hillsdale College English professor, will be speaking on the topic, Becoming a Statesman, 10 Councils from Thomas More. Uh, you're all welcome to join us as we welcome the uh, Hillsdale College students who are here for the summer. Professor Smith will uh, engage that topic. Also, uh, we have lunch available for you today. Lunch is served on the first floor. Uh, you may eat anywhere throughout the building that's open, including the uh, fourth floor terrace. And uh, thank you very much.